All right. I am thrilled to welcome to the Sasaga podcast, Brittany Arthur. So Brittany, please tell us who you are and what you do. Helen, what an absolute pleasure it is to be with you and your listeners at the Sasaga podcast. My name is Brittany. I specialize in human design. You might know another term uh, of design thinking in Japanese for Japanese organizations. And so that's essentially where I spend most of my day, which is working with this innovation methodology to help Japanese companies uh, bring their innovation aspirations to life. So can you tell us for listeners who are have no idea what um, uh, design thinking and human, what was it called the other one? So it's human centered design or design thinking. They're like two, you can use either, either terminology. You might right. see, you might know of either terminology. I've heard of design thinking and I've heard a little bit of human centered design. Is That's that, right. Like, okay, you got it. it. You got it. it. You got it. One. Familiar I am with it. So you got tell it. Us, tell us um, what actually is that and how, how does it apply to people? Sure. So really quickly, it's about making sure that we're solving the right problem before solving the problem right. So I'm sure that lots of the listeners know uh, you've been in, you know, a client might say, you know, we need an app or we need this or we need that. You get in there within 45 minutes. It couldn't be clearer that they don't need an app. They need this whole <laughs> other thing. Mm -hmm. And so we use human centered design uh, as a way to first really scope the problem, understand what's going on. So we have a lot lot of uh, investment in what we call the problem space, understanding what the problem is before going ahead and then solving it. So that's essentially what it's about. Uh, and then how we do that is that it's based on that humanness. So instead of saying, oh, isn't this a really great idea? What we say is it's it's a good idea for who? So of course, we could redesign the ATM experience, going to the ATM, taking out money. Sure, we could redesign that. But imagine if we said redesign that for a blind person. What, how would the solution change? Redesign the ATM experience for you know someone that um, you has that doesn't speak English or doesn't speak the language you know where you are. Uh, so things like that. So it's about making sure that we're solving the problem right before solving, or making sure that we're solving the right problem right. And then of course that second is that it's really driven by the human need rather than simply a business need. I love that. And, you know, I remember from my uh, corporate days when a question that often came up was, you know, we'd be into a conversation like, what actually is the problem that we're solving here? Because <laughs> right. it's and so then you, easy to go. Right, to you look at your watch and you go, hang on a second. How, how have we not talked about that yet? We're three weeks into the project. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's so interesting how people have their own assumptions about what mm -hmm. the problem is. And when you actually get it really opened up, everybody has those different ideas. And you're like, oh, OK, that was a waste. That's of time. right. That's so right. In terms of what you do, then do you you do workshops, you teach people how to apply that into their business? Is that is that what? Right. That's a great question. So we have two streams. So we, uh, I'm the founder of a company called Design Thinking Japan, where we support companies to do two things in their innovation or in education. So we have two streams. One is we're teaching innovation mindsets. For me, I like to think about teaching the innovation mindset as a map. So some, you know, everybody wants innovate everybody wants everyone knows it's important but it's kind of like how do we go about it right where do we even begin mm -hmm. and for me having the design thinking process or human-centered design is actually a process there there can be you know almost like a recipe I can't if you tell me that you have a stakeholder meeting for 60 minutes I can tell you how to spend the first 10 minutes how to spend the next 20 minutes how to spend the next 20 minutes and then go through the entire meeting so mm -hmm. that you've essentially got an innovation map. Now, when you're walking into a meeting, a map within an agenda, mm -hmm. you feel much more confident, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, le I'm leading the meeting, not from a space of, gee, I hope this works out well. I'm sure lots of this Sasaga podcast listeners know they work in multinational, pr probably companies. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen people fly to Germany, fly to Tokyo, uh, and then kind of not really get to the core of what we needed to get to. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the, with the human-centered design um, methodology, I can really reverse engineer where do we want to go. And it's almost like your Google Maps. 
take this, turn left here, go straight. So it really kind of helps you get to where you want to go. Uh, so we help companies uh, either in their mindsets um, or uh, or in their uh, or build, working on a business problem. A really common problem that we have, particularly now, is people wanting to repurpose their existing assets. So we used to do this. We've got all this data. How can we use it better now? And so I help the people through the journey uh, and they're the ones that are the experts and people often feel you know how do you know about you know like centuries old Japanese companies what could, what do you have to tell them and I say well <laughs> that's very easy nothing I have nothing to tell them my job is to hold space in order right. for them to have a conversation right yeah and that is that is so important because that's there's so much here the that mindset of like this person is the expert and this is who we listen to and that that's right. um, that role of the facilitator really is um I, I was gonna say undervalued but it's not even recognized by a lot of people right and so I, I you know it's it's quite good because I I there I don't have this kind of like stress of having to be an expert in everything my expert is, or my expertise is in holding a safe space in order for people to have conversations that they've never had before mm-hmm yeah. And it's, um, you know, I've talked before on the Sussex podcast about how when you have that area of expertise, you get very sort of focused and someone coming in with the beginner's mindset, uh, beginner's mind is um, it can bring in all sorts of new possibilities. Because I'm, I'm guessing that you'd be asking questions that sort of open things up and and uh, spark new new perspectives, new ideas from people. Yeah, that's exactly right. We also believe in each person representing a particular voice. So we work in in, in interdisciplinary teams or multidisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. So um, this is quite interesting, particularly in a Japanese context where people would say, but how can you have the CEO and the most junior person in the same room and have an equal conversation? Mm -hmm. In, In the West, we, you know, we kind of have this idea of, you know, we're all the same, all equals. And that can, you know, that can go... Well, that can work well to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Um, I've recognized that it requires a little bit of tweaking in Japan. And so what mm-hmm. the way that in which that we that we do that is that we say, you, you as a CEO are an expert in being a CEO. You mm-hmm. as the junior are an expert as being the junior voice. So the CEO can't speak as a junior anymore. This yeah. person might not even remember, you know, <laughs> what, it's, what it's like. Yeah. And so very clearly saying that your voice, your specific voice is really important. We don't need generalizations. Mm-hmm. I need to say this is an issue for accounting. I need sales to say this is an issue for sales, and I need IT to say this is an issue for this is an issue for IT, so that we can have that conversation together rather than we all talk generally about as a company. Right. I love that, and I'm guessing also this leads to getting over the tatemai thing and getting into <laughs> more honne. Right. You're you're allowing the space for the honne. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So it's a lot of, um, and so what we'd like to do is uh, that we take a co-creation approach. So it's Mm -hmm. not, I'm telling you you're doing wrong or that your department is running late or something. It's we're all in this current issue. Mm -hmm. Let's map the ecosystem together. Now Mm -hmm. you tell me what's going on in your department. I'll tell you what's going on in my department. And Mm -hmm. together we'll, we'll map a picture. And through this common built picture, we'll develop a language around the issues that we're working with and then move forward. So if you are, following um and this is why i quite, I, I very much enjoy human centered design or design thinking in, in japan because mm. it there's there's a lot of it that's quite similar to traditional japanese management principles and when we apply that um you can actually save yourself quite a bit of time while still being quite aware of those cultural sensitivities. Mm. So for example, mm. we don't have discussions. We do individual work and then group work, right? So it's mm. write down your individual thought and then we as a group will then discuss the individual thoughts rather than, okay, everyone, welcome to the table. Who'd like to start? Like, yeah. forget it. That is absolutely <laughs> not how it works. Like we say, okay, everyone, we're we're going to take four minutes or five minutes, however long it is. And yeah. I want you to write down the three top issues facing your department, Brilliant. right? We put them in the table yeah. and then you, the person that picks up the post, it doesn't have to be a person that wrote it because it's yeah. a common problem. And yeah. so when you move from this is you versus me to an us, 
you yeah. get that Japanese buy-in that sometimes um, might take a little longer, as you mentioned there. Hone mm-hmm. that they might. <laughs> Could could you share like is there like an example of a like a really amazing success story that you've seen among your clients where they've um, applied what they what they learned? Sure. So I can tell you one that's maybe you know like the kinds where we have these big, huge Japanese catered to companies and that they completely rethought how they did their business. And that was really great. Right. So that's kind of one story. Mm. Um, but ma- ma- maybe let me tell you a story that maybe less kind of wow, mm. but much more impactful. So there was one okay. particular company we were working with um, whose accounting department was consistently late uh, in, in their particular tasks and it was causing headaches amongst the company you know mm-hmm. financing company is a in a company is essentially the oxygen and if we don't have enough of oxygen pumping we don't have enough money pumping around the business we've got an issue right yeah and so usually a non-human centered design approach or a non-design thinking approach is the accounting department is late mm-hmm. let's build them some kind of reminder system right about yeah. how they can be on time. Perfect, yeah. right? Yeah. But a human-centered design approach is let's go and talk to accounting, see what's going on. Yeah. So we went in and we said to accounting, it looks like you're under a lot of stress um, mm-hmm. because we also saw that there was a, there was an increase, for example, in, in, um, in sick leave at the end of each month. So, you know, you started recognizing that this was not just an issue of work, that it was really affecting their physical health yeah. and then mental health then obviously mm. we said what's going on and they said well we actually don't get the data that we need from these three departments until three days before our close so we have right. to work a month essentially in three days there you go yeah <laughs> so what we mm. did and then those three departments we bought in mm. and said okay Talk to us a little bit about where, you know, so this is the, this is what's important to account. And this is what we said, accounting, you speak as accounting and then the other departments you speak as you. Mm-hmm. And we had this conversation. We did, we mapped this journey mm-hmm. um, in terms of the month of like what days kind of are peak days for people so that you could build a common empathy so it wasn't just only accounting, but mm-hmm. accounting could also see the other, what's going on with the other departments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the sales department, for example, said, well, I can't give you this data until this happens and this other mm-hmm. company and this other department said well I didn't know that was even important to you so something that was that was actually causing physical sickness in mm-hmm. employees was simply just someone not knowing how something plays a role in somebody else's work and so what we saw was um we were then able to create a new process or a new system, a new journey for all of the d- departments that was that was appropriate for everyone. Of course, you know, you can't, you know, play favorites. You need to be able to give and take a little bit. Mm-hmm. Accounting no longer days to do 30 days work. You know, sales also knew what they needed to do. We had a, you know, we had a decent um journey essentially a decent promise from each from each department that we could keep Mm -hmm. and since then accounting not only was able to deliver on time morale went up sickness sick days went down and so this is when you just recognize let's make sure we're solving the human problem and it's the right human problem before jumping in and creating some kind of cloud solution where we (laughs) have automatic reminders for accounting to to, to send their data right so that's just one that's that's not necessarily wasn't a new iphone or anything but it perhaps might be something that people can relate to oh that is just like you said that's really a high impact example that's that's such a great great story um so i really i just want to pause for sasaga podcast listeners to just reflect for a moment in your work in your business where things are not going as you want them to go and maybe you're making assumptions about what the problem is and perhaps it is something much deeper it's also related to um a few episodes ago i was talking about the the value of uh, broadening your perspective so this is also what um, you know you're facilitating is that broadening mm. of perspective, right? Yeah, I love it because it's it's the broadening. It, it's not missing. You can just ask someone, 
Yeah. Hey, this isn't happening or yeah. I'm struggling with this or I need this. And it'd be really great if I could get this a little bit earlier. Is it what, how, how does that look like for you? So yeah. engaging with that person in dialogue um, and inviting them to, to solve the problem, to understand the problem yeah. rather than staying in your own space is, is really important. Fabulous. I love it. So I, I feel like I could uh, continue talking on this topic because it's absolutely fascinating. But I do want to get into talking about Brittany um, <laughs> and especially the, the, the Sasaga success cycle. So in, mm -hmm. in, if you're thinking through those phases of self-care, mm -hmm. of planning, of communication, of productivity, what's a, a story, a personal story that you can share with us where you had some kind of struggle, um, mm. a difficult time that you've overcome in one of those areas? Well, Helen, um, just to let this, uh, this as a podcast listeners know, I'm actually um, seven months pregnant now as we wrote this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my story that I wanted to, to share with you had very much to do with self-care as a business mm. owner mm. Um, and running a business especially in the you know in the business of people in the business of service particularly if you're in the in the Japanese service industry you know that sometimes they require a higher level of service than others yeah. um yeah. I I had this mindset of gunman the gunman mindset gunman yeah. mm -hmm. just keep going not feeling well don't worry about it gunman 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 they just pushing through yep. um and at the very, in my first trimester, I was really, um, I had windows of, of the day where I could work, but, some, but, the, but the other, the majority of the day, my body just needed to rest. Yeah. And I had this kind of internal fight. Come on. Like this, this between gambate and gaman, right? Come on, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, and what I am um, after quite a few weeks of trying to fight my body, I kind of recognize, well, this isn't working for anybody. Um, let's take a step back. Let's reframe. Mm -hmm. And I then moved to working from, from in this mindset of work in spite of my body mm -hmm. to working with my body. And things just got in almost immediately exponentially better. Mm -hmm. For me, um, the lesson was, uh, and for anyone that's not <laughs> seven months pregnant, um, is that, and this is certainly a lesson I'm taking um, far beyond this pregnancy, mm -hmm. is very much that listening to your body, working with your body instead of in spite of your body. Because for so long, mm -hmm. I definitely was that I've got a headache, get up, don't take a nap if you need to, like didn't listen. Mm. Um, and I was very interested actually, because I remember the first time that I even considered, mm -hmm. even the consideration that my physical body, and then of, then again, even my, my female processes that happen inside my body, like my menstrual cycle and things like that, mm -hmm. that that might even affect my business was yeah. when I first heard you. Yes. When I first heard you talk about that. And I yeah. thought, well, that's true. There are moments of the day and when I can actually do, you know, and I'm my, my, I own my own business, which means I can schedule things according to my own, um, to, to how I'm feeling. Yes. Um, and so for me, my absolute, uh, current, um, or most recent story has been to in the self-care part has been to work with your body yeah. instead of in spite of your body no matter how ridiculous it might seem if you need a nap at 2 30 in the afternoon if you need to have a second dinner for for whatever reason yeah. your body says I'm, I'm hungry you need a second breakfast you know there's so just um, for me, that's definitely been my area of learning. And I found it quite interesting. And it's probably not surprising that in your success cycle, it's step one, because I found that the other three steps then became much easier. Yeah. You know, and it's great that you point that out, because actually, when I first was putting the whole concept together, um, I, it was so funny. Now I think back, I had self-care as phase four. I mean, Last, still, 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 obviously, it's the it's the week of your of your period, right. um, because that's you know physically right. what it is. Um, but in terms of like the way I put it into a diagram. And I was calling that phase four the last thing because mm -hmm. in my mind it was like rest last, right, <laughs> like, right. Well, 
goodness, no, 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 no. Rest that's, that's first. A, it's rest first. Yes. It's absolutely self-care first. And so that's when yes. I switched it and, and put uh, self-care as phase one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, um, you know, thinking back to it, it's quite some years ago since I had that uh, pregnancy experience. And I, I remember the, the first trimester, the, the fatigue Incredible. at that time. Yeah you just there's nothing like it there's yeah. nothing like it so um yeah it's so important and and it's so common for women to to push through and the, you know not it's not only being pregnant it's whatever um stage you are in your life just really it's about slowing down and listening mm-hmm. to your body exactly there's, there's so much like push 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 do 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 and meet everybody else's expectations yeah or i couldn't possibly sit down or have a nap at 2 30 why not yeah yeah I love it so much that is brilliant so I want to talk about a little bit related to sort of self-care and and and, uh personal energy so Mm -hmm. what um what energizes you it's moments like this Helen honestly um for me I I I'm one of those people who gets energy from people so I leave a workshop of 20 people and I just feel like buzzing it's for me just the moment that I feel that I'm kind of in line with what I'm supposed to do in the in the universe uh, yeah. as well as giving someone value and for me I just enjoy that and I just bounce off the walls afterwards um I just that's for me always the moment when I'm energized when I'm in the service of, of others others especially when it's you know other people um and then things things that you know are perhaps like the opposite of that yeah you know I are honestly things where I I don't see the why behind something like you have to do this or something you know what I mean so I this this was why I was you know I was such a terrible intern you know, when I was younger, because it was you just get these spreadsheets and you know just like clean it the clean them up and you're like okay but why you know and so it's probably probably not um surprising that my work now is essentially um clarifying or giving language to the why and then leveraging so the, the 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 inspiration or the or the, um, the expertise of others in order to solve the solution oh my goodness that is that is absolutely fabulous yeah. what um what advice would you give to yourself, say, 10 or 20 years ago? So interesting. Um, I find that I'm constantly relearning or I'm constantly reminded of similar lessons um, in my life. And, you know, I think uh, one of those certainly was the connection to, to your body. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I've I think finally um, that I've had an experience um kind of grand enough um to really finally learn it and so I think I would have just told myself don't wait until you're pregnant to start looking after yourself don't wait until you're pregnant to to listen to your body don't wait until you're pregnant to to rest and eat well and take time when you need um and so I think that would probably uh, be, the th- be that thing, uh, which is the, the practices that I'm implementing now. Um, I just probably didn't need to wait so long. I probably could right. have been doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's often the case, isn't it, that uh, we have to have that experience, that the, 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 the lesson that, <laughs> that kind of uh, shows us, hmm, doesn't have to be that way. And I just want to reiterate this message. I've talked about this on the Sassica podcast before, but I really want to reiterate it, especially to the... Um, those who who are mothers to be or have you know have have uh, who, who are mothers is you are creating a human being i mean that's that's pretty significant so it's okay to to have a rest it's okay that's right you know? right and i'm sure that there are other women that are creating other things they're bringing other things to life maybe it's a project maybe it's a business maybe it's something else yeah um and you're you're equally deservant of that time that your body requires yeah and that part about I think that this is great I love that you that you bring this up as well because it's the that very often as as women um, I mean yes probably men as well I'm just really focusing on the women is the um, that we're very often into creating, producing, achieving, 
and then moving on to what's the next thing we've got to create, produce and achieve without taking that time to rest and and um, or even if we, as I said before, reverse it. So it's not that you're resting at the end, but you're resting before going into the next thing. And you're just taking that time to really reflect and say, wow, I actually did something really, really great there. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So what else would you like to share with the Sasaga podcast listeners today? Oh, I would just uh, love to thank them for their time. <laughs> I would love to thank them for their time. And if they would love to know more about human-centered design or design thinking, about how they can apply it in their work, or even how they can apply it in their lives. You know, I always, you know, laugh. Sometimes you'll have, uh, you know, people think that it's just a, like innovation or getting to the right problem before is a, is a corporate issue. And I think how many times have we had um uh, partners or as someone say to their spouse um i want to move or i need a i need a cleaner or i need mm-hmm. to so they make this kind of like big statement mm-hmm. maybe you don't need a cleaner maybe what you do need is just a little bit more help mm-hmm. or and because then if you say i need a cleaner and then of course someone might say don't be ridiculous right mm-hmm. and then you think no i just need a little bit more help or i just need a little acknowledgement i just need someone to say thank you yeah. or you know, I just need someone to say thank you. Or if you're saying, you know, you go to your spouse and you say, I want to, you know, join a tennis club. And you think, oh gosh, well, that's 10 grand a head, you know, for something that we've never even done in our lives. Why would we ever do that? Mm-hmm. Maybe you just want to say to your partner, but actually because you're jumping to solutions instead of digging deeper into you, you understanding you, you're the user in this case, yeah. understanding, well, why do I want to play tennis? Well, I want to do something new. Perfect. We'll tell, or I want to do something with my partner. We'll yeah. tell your partner, I'd like to us to do something and begin with just walks around the block, just begin with walks in the park or something, and then kind of go from there. So for me, yeah. if you want to learn a little bit more about how to define and give clarity to a problem, give language to a problem, um, and not just kind of you know, talking about it, but learn actual strategies, actual methodologies. I can give you templates that you can sit down with your partner for 45 minutes and you can prioritize your home improvement projects. So, so, you know, things like that. Um, For me, it's, um, I uh, have my business, which is, um, you know, I'm very lucky that our our business is doing well. So I also um, do for free because I think it's something that I wanted to share with people. And I, I talk about, human centered design innovation things like that on my business karaoke podcast where i was very lucky to have you as a guest helen um and i also run a meetup uh which is where i i teach you online that people can kind of jump in for like an hour and i show them some templates about how they can manage um doing things on their own as well so if you'd like to learn more there's um those places which i can certainly share with uh, those links that i can share with helen afterwards Yep, we'll pop those in the show notes. That's brilliant. And I'm just thinking, wow, I wonder if you might like to be a guest speaker in the Sasaga Cafe. That would be like... Um, oh my gosh, of course. Just, oh, really well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So let's... Um, well, yeah. we can talk off the... Talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about, we'll talk about that, about that as a, 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 at another stage. Great. That's, that would be so Yeah, great. so those little things, because I, I just think it's enough of just guessing, you know what I mean? Mm. We don't have to guess our way through things the same way that you wouldn't get in a car or you wouldn't get on the train and guess how to get somewhere. Like I've got my Google maps open the second I'm out the door, you know, Mm. Mm. Um, why don't we do that? Why don't we do that in our conversations? Why don't we do that in our business? Yeah. And then of course we wonder as women, particularly, of course, as men, as you mentioned, but women particularly, why we don't, why we have a little bit more anxiousness entering conversations or difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Well, if I didn't have a map and I stepped outside, I'd be nervous as well. It's the same thing. You can't enter a conversation without a map Mm -hmm. and expect to feel good and expect to feel confident. Yeah. So true. I love that. Oh my goodness. Brilliant, brilliant conversation. Thank you. I feel like we've just got so much gold out of this. Um, So We will uh, link in the show notes and I want to thank you, Brittany. It's been just such a pleasure. Just like, wow, I feel like we could have talked for hours, but I did want to keep it relatively short. No, of course. I mean, (laughs) exactly. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.